Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. Hello and welcome to another edition of Musical Talk. I'm Thos Ribbits and in homage to that wonderful musical The Wizard of Oz, I'm currently paying no attention to anyone who's behind a curtain. And for those of you with a more Shakespearean bent, and why not at this time of the 400th anniversary of his death, I should say that's a load of old Arras. Well, if you're generous, you might have described that opening as funny. But there is something definitely funny going on in London. And it's a little bit of an event. Because in London, right now, until the 14th of May, you can see the very first show by Lynn Ayans and Stephen Flarty. Now, if you think I know those names, well, you certainly do. They are pretty much gold standard Broadway musical writers. And over the last 30 years, they've produced a whole number of shows, many of which you will definitely have heard of, including My Favourite Year, Ragtime, Susical, Rocky the Musical and Anastasia. And that's not the complete list. That's just a few. But their very first notable work together comes from 1988, and it's the musical farce Lucky Stiff. It's a musical based on the book from 1983 by Michael Butterworth called The Man Who Broke the Bank at Monte Carlo, not to be mistaken with the old musical song from 1892. But that book was turned into a comedy musical by Aeons and Flaherty in 1988. And whilst you may or may not have heard of it, it certainly had some life. It was produced off-Broadway in 1988. It was produced in Lincoln here in Britain in 1994. Then it came to the West End in 1997. It was produced again here in Britain in York in 2003. And it was turned into a film last year in 2015 with some new songs written by Ayrns and Flaherty. So it is one of those rare musicals which has been turned into a musical film. So what's it all about? Well, here's the blurb from the current London production at the Drayton Arms Theatre. Something funny's going on. With a mysterious murder, mistaken identities and a corpse in a wheelchair, Lucky Stiff will leave you dying of laughter. When Harry's uncle is murdered, his dull life is about to be turned upside down with an inheritance of six million dollars. There's just one catch. He must first take his uncle's embalmed body to Monte Carlo for one final trip of a lifetime. Well, Lucky Stiff is here in London at the Drayton Arms, which is very close to Gloucester Road Tube Station and is where last year's The Baker's Wife was put on so wonderfully by the company MKEC. As with that show, Lucky Stiff is being directed by Mark Kelly and he's a very excellent and, I think, thoughtful director. I really loved his work last year. I thought The Baker's Wife was one of the most enjoyable things I saw in the course of the year. And so I was intrigued to discover that this year he was directing Lucky Stiff. And then, when he offered me the opportunity to talk to two members of the cast, I couldn't resist. So, for the rest of this programme, you'll be hearing a conversation between me and the very lovely Michelle Crook and Andrew Truluck as we talk about Ernst and Flaherty's Lucky Stiff. Musical Talk. My name is Michelle Crook and I am playing Annabelle Glick in the Drayton Arm production of Lucky Stiff. My name's Andrew Truluck. I'm playing Vinny De Ruzio in Lucky Stiff. Now, Lucky Stiff is one of those names which has been banded around and people, I think, know something of the name but probably don't know very much about the show, even though it's had an American production, not on Broadway, I gather, but it's certainly been in London before. Mm-hmm. And, of course, there's been a film recently, so it's, it's got a heritage. It's by Ernst and Flaherty. You may want to correct my pronunciation. No, that's but good. would you like to briefly, without ruining any of the storyline, just briefly explain something about Lucky Stiff? OK. Lucky Stiff is about a young man called Harry Harry Witherspoon (laughs) called Harry Witherspoon who inherits six million dollars from his uncle now the thing is he doesn't just get the six million dollars there are a few things that he has to do along the way I won't tell you what those things are and what happens, but along the way, there are other various stories and characters that are following him and trying to get that money for various reasons and their own stories are happening. The one thing he missed out was the fact that he has to go to Monte Carlo and take with him his dead uncle. Oh, yes. (laughs) 
the stiff in question. <laughs> the, the lucky stiff. Yes, yes. He has to make out that he's still alive, and so he takes him on this journey around Monte Carlo doing various things that he has to do and pretend that this uncle of his is actually still alive. So that brings a lot of comedy anyway to the piece. And after the week, he inherits the money. He has to spend a whole week in Monte Carlo and then he inherits yes, the money. Yes, then he gets the money. Yeah. But, you know, the question is, does he last the week? Yes. Does he get the money? They're all so vested interests, So you need to come yeah. and see the show, basically. Yeah. And there's a young find... lady called Annabelle Glick who is following him because she's been mentioned in the will. If yes. he doesn't succeed at taking his uncle and doing all these special things that the uncle has dictated, then she is from the dog's home of Brooklyn and she will get the six million. So her yes, interests so are very... I am hot on his heels, making sure that he gets everything correct down mm-hmm. to the finest detail. That sounds a hoot, but it's been described in various different ways. It's been described as a murder mystery musical. It's been described Ooh. as a farce. Yeah. I think it can also be described as a, a, a cultural comedy because isn't the hero British? He is. Yes. And obviously he's got lots of From non-British East. relatives and it's all set in Monte Carlo. So there's that element of um, cultural difference and cultural comedy there. How would you describe the tone and how, you, how is this production? What is the production that you're in fixing that tone? Are you doing it high performance? Are you looking for the inner truth? You know, you, you I, tell me. We're playing it pretty normal, I think, because the book is so well written and the songs are so well written too mm-hmm. that it's sort of, you don't really need to do very much. You just follow what's on the page. Because the comedy springs from the fact that we're all playing it real, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. The comedy is just there, isn't it? And the fact of all of these situations that he just seems to be in. Like if you were in that situation in real life, it would be funny. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. So I don't think there's an element where you have to try and find the comedy. It is very much just there. I would probably say it's a comedy farce. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's based on the suppose... man that broke the bank at Monte Carlo. That's what it's based on. Yeah, I think it's just a, an everyday story about Joe Bloggs from from East Grinstead. Yeah, the underdog. Can I say it doesn't sound at all like an everyday story? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All of you, those dead. You never know when you're on the tube. Around. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there seems to be a lot of dead people on the tube. Yeah. I've, just been, I've just been one for half an hour. So. <laughs> no, but I suppose what I'm asking then also is your own performances. How have you decided to pitch it? Now you, you mentioned really and finding the truth which of course is how one gets character it's you don't mug a line you you speak the truth of it but are the characters slightly grotesque are they slightly heightened or would you expect actually to meet them on a street (laughs) it may be a very specialized street you're both nodding so yeah i know from my point of view anyway i'm i'm playing her real and i do believe that people like annabelle glick do exist And I don't think that there's anything, you know, apart from obviously being on stage and you maybe make Mm. things a bit bigger, I don't think the characters are heightened to... No. You know, yeah, it's not sort of... You know how you can sort of get some quite zany, over-the-top characters sometimes, and you think, "Mm, maybe isn't quite right, but I think, yeah, we're all playing it from a... Mm -hmm. I'm an optometrist, so I'm real. (laughs) Yeah. It's a real everyday job. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm from the Universal Dog Home of Brooklyn, and I want to just save the dogs and everything. You that's know. your passion and in life, yeah, that's, isn't it? Yeah, that's dogs. my passion, yeah. And, you know, I know that there are people out there that are that passionate about animals. And, yeah, I think they're And really... it's a fabulous cast, and we're all playing it very real. Yeah, and because, truthful. Because and... we want the comedy to come, people to laugh at it. When people start laughing, you know you're doing a good job. Mm. Have you seen the film? I've got to ask you. Because it only came out last year, 2014, or oh, a year and a half ago, I suppose, but went to Cannes, I think, but hasn't really been on a very wide release at all. No, it I was only shown in the it. US. Um, it is available on Amazon, but only in the US. Yes, and I've seen the trailer. Mm-hmm. I've um, seen the trailer, yes. but apart from that, I haven't seen the film. I, there's part of me that doesn't want to see it until yes. after, because I don't, I don't know. Yeah, or, or look at it and think, oh, am I doing that wrong, as if that's meant to be the right way yeah it's always good to see it after and think oh that was an interesting way or you know because obviously everyone comes at it from a different angle and I, yeah I don't sort of want to a few days before we open yeah. oh, I've done it wrong ah. yeah because it is a musical that's the thing it's, it's quite interesting to me because I think it's interesting you said farce okay. which is one of the terms that's been banded around for it now the thing about farce is of course, is of course but it's it turns on a sixpence. It's a very tightly written, clever thing. It may not look it. It may look like a world of destruction, but of course, farce isn't that at all. It's an extremely nice piece of clockwork. But it's quite difficult to insert music or songs into a situation like that, isn't it? Or is it? 
In... How, how does this work as a... I mean, it's a farce in the loose sense of strange and wonderful things happen and it piles on top of each other. But how, how does one put... Well, this is a question for you. Is the mechanics of acting. How do you put a song into a piece like this and not lose the energy? It's so well written that it's, the songs are more or less an extension of the character and what, what's happening to them. Yeah, and I would say that as long as you don't go from I'm acting to now I'm singing a song, yes. mm-hmm. so it's not you like can't it's lose it. <laughs> yeah, you know how sometimes it's... Well, I don't, I don't know, you know, some people when they perform, they're acting and they're saying these lines and characters and then it's like, now I'm singing a song. And that's mm. where it gets disconnected. Whereas if you are just continuing it as if you were saying those lines and there wasn't music and you still got that truth and belief as if you were doing it as a monologue and there was no music attached to it, it doesn't matter that you're now singing because you're still getting across the story, but it just happens to be through a song. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. I'm, yeah. I'm really pleased to hear that. That's also a sign of a well-crafted modern musical in that sense, isn't it? And right. they make it easy. Yes. You know, a lot mm-hmm. of the way that you go into a song, it's not... It is so well connected. It's just that a lot of, the of them, scene, but yeah, 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 exactly. And so it's not punctuation. I think that's the thing because, let's say, if you go back to a Gershwin musical, you know, you get the lovely comedy scene with all the performance, and then they stop and sing their song, mm-hmm. which may or may not be connected to what's going on, but but there's this. It sounds to me, it sounds to me, the way you're describing it, it very much isn't the case of song as punctuation. It's song as continuation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know, there is some songs in it that are very much you're getting into the brain of the character and you're really finding out how they feel in that situation as opposed to um, necessarily moving the story along. But there's a nice balance, isn't there? You've got other ones that they they just go straight into the song and it's just smooth and it's quick and it's easy and it just happens, doesn't Mm -hmm. it? Because also in some of the scenes, the songs begin and then in the middle of the song or a quarter of the way through the song the scene carries on mm. and then you go back to the song again so it really is just an extension yeah it's it's, it's a beautiful score too it really is very clever well let's mm. talk about it because actually it's their first proper show isn't it mm-hmm. the writers i think it's late 80s 88 something like that yeah and i don't think it necessarily jumped off the page at the time it's one of these things that's been a slow burner of it, although the fact it's had a film made is quite impressive after 30 odd years. Yeah. So, you know, it's obviously got some residual love for it, some people. But in terms of the score, how, how would you describe it? Does it feel like an early score by a pair of composers? Do you know their work from elsewhere? Or would you say that it seems fully formed? It is fully formed. Um, mm. I know them from Ragtime, Susical, yeah. you know, all this stuff. And there's a range there already, just those two you've picked. Yeah. Those are, you know, two very different musicals with very different feels and tones. and but I think Lucky Stiff is up there among, uh, with Ragtime. It's as, as beautifully crafted as Ragtime is. Mm. I think they're very... The, both of them, I think, are very clever and innovative writers, and it shows. Yeah, and the music as well, especially in Lucky Stiff, it's, it's similar, but it's so different, and there's so many different styles, and the, the music fits the characters, doesn't mm-hmm. it? You know, and... I, th- I just think it's amazing. I think it's fantastic. There's a, a particular song. I won't ruin it, but there's a particular song that that starts in a in a way. It's your song, in fact. It's Annabelle's song. It starts oh, in a way yeah. that you think she's going to be singing about this man, or you know, yeah, a you person. You think it's yes. going to go in a certain but direction, but it isn't a person at all, and it's fabulous. It's just so clever. It's misdirection mm. in a song. Yeah. Yes. It's oh, I like beautifully it. done. Keeps mm. you on your toes. Really funny. Yeah. 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 It is good. And what about the interaction between your own characters? Is there much in this? It seems I like actually a bit never a meet you. Oh. No, we meet right at the very end. We do, yes, that's it. And you're pointing a gun at my head. That's it, yes. <laughs> I meet her then. Pleasingly, yeah. and our listeners can't see that, that is no longer happening. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's still got the gun. <laughs> yes, I, but I don't actually physically meet you. I don't run into you. Our paths do not cross. No, they don't at all, do no. they? But we are very close proximity to each other. I'm it, literally... Just with Harry. Mm, yeah, and the body, of course. And Yeah, and, and the <laughs> Yeah, Uncle Anthony. The eponymous stiff. You run into my sister quite a few times, Rita. Yeah, the hotel but then room. even even then, I'm always running away from her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't yeah. actually, until that hotel room where I meet you afterwards, is the first time that... My sister's a bit of a crazy, crazy person. <laughs> <laughs> Not in real life. She's no. gorgeous, is our Liz yes. Chadwick, but I feel very lucky to be in this. Mark and Liz and Kieran, who's the MD. They're also lovely and it's such a nice company as well. Mm. So how did you come to be in it? I auditioned. (laughs) I auditioned, uh, same as everybody else. 
they sent me a song to look at, came in, did it, and then they rang me a few days after and said, would you like to do it? And I said, uh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> I Let me think. <laughs> yes. Same for you as well? Yes. I auditioned actually here. Um, We're in Fulham at the moment, so. Yes, mm-hmm. we are in Fulham. And... Yeah, did the first round, then came back to a recall, did material and a dance round and everything. And then, um, yeah, I think it was actually the next day Mm -hmm. I got my offer through. Um, But my agent actually didn't pick up the email until (laughs) Good Friday at eight o'clock. So I didn't think I got it. (laughs) But when you learnt, it was a Good Friday. (laughs) Yes, it it was a very Good Friday. Yeah, so... And she's absolutely perfect for the role too. And I do love you, and I would say that anyway. Oh, and, uh, he's just, yeah, I'll pay him later. <laughs> Fine. Thank now, you. I've got a question about scope, because the, the show that this production team did last year was The Baker's Wife. Indeed. How beautiful it was as well. But the thing about The Baker's Wife, it's in a very small set world. It's in a sort of French village, almost set in time, sort of set in aspect, almost. You know, there's a little bit of people coming in and out, but not very much. So it's a very small world which you can sort of pick up in detail. Lucky Stiff is a much bigger canvas, isn't it? You have a sort of British hero, you've got Monte Carlo, you've got all these characters who have such passion in their lives, but it perhaps gives them tunnel vision, shall we say. That feels like a very different scape, almost like a filmscape, in fact. The very fact it's been turned into a film obviously means it does have that opportunity. But we're in this beautiful, wonderful um, fringe venue of Drayton Arms, lovely for intimacy. How does one square the balance between scope and intimacy? It is quite an intimate musical, really, because you're, you're very, um, what's the word I'm looking for, engaged by every character that you see. Mm. Um, when, they, when they interact with each other, it's, it's engaging, because you meet them all at, right at the beginning of the show as well. You meet every single one of them. Mm. What do you think? And I th- Even though it goes you know, to so many places and so many mm-hmm. things happening and everything like that, it's done in such a way and like with the set design and it's very minimal isn't it and it's so clever the way that they've done it that you don't need it it doesn't need it it, it, it does work up so without actual physical sets and things, yeah. yeah and i actually did lucky stiff and played the role of annabelle when i was at college oh you oh right on, yeah no. so we oh. did it as our third year production and so when i heard that lucky stiff was happening I was so excited. I was like, oh, I have to do it again. Like, it was amazing. But again, that was in a small studio theatre, very intimate. And mm. I just think it works. It doesn't... I, see, it, I, I think it would get lost if it was in a massive... You wouldn't put it in the Palladium. That, well, yes. No, Harking... but I mean, they, you could make it work in the oh, Palladium. Course, but... You know, you'd have a cast of 50 and, you know, things like that. But it works mm-hmm. as a small show, a small ensemble you, you mentioned ten. at the beginning that it's never been on Broadway, and I think mm. there's a reason that it's never been on Broadway, because it is intimate. Um, and it needs a small Yeah, theater. and what it wouldn't does. be yeah. what it is... Had it been. ...if you, you know... Overblew it. Yeah. I think some things just work smaller, don't they? Mm-hmm. I think I should clarify that not being on Broadway is no way a sign of anything not being good. It just no. means that it can go somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Because it started yeah. its life off Broadway, yeah. and it's had... A revival a couple of years ago at the York Theatre in, in New York. So it's not dead by any means. No, yeah. no, the imagination. Not, <laughs> no, quite the reverse, in fact. It's live, isn't it? Mm. Well, it's only the central character who might be dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ish, at least. Yes, he, he's very but dead. Is he <laughs> dead? <laughs> yeah, well. Oh. Oh. <laughs> now, am I right in thinking, and I genuinely don't know because I haven't yet seen it, I'm looking forward to seeing it very much, but the central character, Harry. 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 With a spoon. Yeah, is British. Hmm? But he's the only British character, essentially, isn't he? Are, are most of the other characters non-British? The m- main characters are non-British, as in they're from different parts. America, of, but yeah, Atlantic City. The, there's an incredible ensemble in this show, and they play so many different characters. Like, they literally go off stage, come back on, and there's somebody completely different. So you've got Harry with a spoon, and then you've got his landlady, which is also... Yeah. So she's I'll also British. Barbara. Yeah, Barb. Mm-hmm. And the other people that live in the same, you know... Housing. Yeah, yeah, and everything like that. So you have, you've got those tiny little characters. And then they also come back in the second half, which I won't say yeah. how, but... Yeah, so the sort of, I suppose, main characters of the stories, he's the only British one, but there is 
a lot of random other characters mm. to just appear for a scene. Well, the reason I ask, and forgive me, I just wonder that there's perhaps a double meaning of a title, which may be all too obvious to everyone else, but is for Lucky Stiff Harry rather than the corpse? Because obviously in cultural sense, it has been perceived by many American commentators that the formal and reserved ways of the Brit might be perceived as being stuff-shirted or, or stiff. In fact, it is slang, isn't it, sometimes for mm-hmm. um, a Brit. So is the Lucky Stiff our British protagonist? It's an interesting question. There is some realisation at the end of the show that that might be the case, yes. So that, that is at least an interpretation. Yes. Yeah. Because mm. I did wonder, because obviously there's this sense perhaps it is uh, a culture of comedy as well as being a farce, you know, that it is... If using the stereotypes, particularly prevalent in Hollywood or uh, American stage, that, you know, the Brit is the quiet, reserved character around which other zany characters may revolve, this doesn't feel a million miles away from that. Um, yeah, it's it's an old trope, <laughs> but, uh, but it works every time, you know, it's, it's a great comedy uh, st- standby. So how do you, as British actors, find yourself playing the non-British roles who have to then um, whirl your magic around this kind of sort of central... I won't say cipher because he has a character, but he is much less broadly drawn, perhaps. Well, he's bro- he is broadly drawn. Oh, he is broadly drawn. Mm. Very broadly, because you get to know an awful lot about Harry in a Not very short space shoes. of time. Yes. The fact that he sells shoes, he's going home, he can't afford to pay his rent, he goes home to cold stew every night, he lives with a punk, a lorry driver, <laughs> <laughs> a landlady, a spinster with a cold. You, know, you learn a lot about these... What, what's going on yes. in his life. His context. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So you learn an awful lot about him before he even knows that he's inherited all this money. Mm. I think you just do your research about the character and you read the description about your character and just try and relate to them in a way... Well, they do, they do offer a, a great character breakdown at the back of yeah, the Yeah, and you, oh, you sort of... Yeah, yeah, you read it and it really says, you know... The background and the the upbringing and you know their beliefs and what they want and things like that and I think whether they're British or not, it's not really that you, material, then, really. Yeah, you you just do your research in the character and then just find a way that you can connect to it. You know, I I don't hate dogs, but I'm not you know a lover and a fighter for dogs. But uh, so I have to think to myself, what do I love? What would I you know try and protest against? And what would I try and protect? And things like that. Um, and then obviously you add on the accent and yes. things and yeah. So it, it's it's very clear to me the way you speak that you you know you 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 see your characters absolutely. And this comes back to the beginning of the conversation. You see your characters as real people, mm. and they're not caricatures. They're not uh, grotesques. They are real people, and therefore from that comes the character. Um, I'm always interested, therefore, during the rehearsal periods where you are also discovering your characters and the interaction between your characters and others. Do has there been a situation either on this show or any other show actually? I'm just interested to see as actors how you deal with this, whereby someone has to reimagine their performance or their character during the rehearsal period, uh, and it must happen presumably, but then your characters who have got used to performing against one interpretation then have to reinterpret, or in your case, if I may say, well, you've done the show before, um, you will have therefore had some imprint in your head about how it might be done or how it could be done, and you've now got to reimagine it for this production. This is about your performances and your attitudes as actors. And, you know, you are creative people. You are having to create something out of almost nothing or the ethereal, you know, a page with some words on it or some music is quite a t- daunting thing to be looking at, it seems to me, speaking as a, you know, a, a, a lay person. <laughs> um, how do you do that? When you say about the fact that I've done it before, it was about eight years ago now, I think, so... When you were 12? Yes. Yeah, when I was 10. So um, (laughs) I, when I got the script through and the songs that I had to learn for the audition, as much as the words were sort of still in there somewhere in my brain and they sort of came back, I still did the research and looked at the words and came at it from who I am now. Mm. Because obviously a lot's happened in my life in eight years. So I'm not the same person that I was then. So... I can draw on different life experiences and different parts of the material that I wouldn't have necessarily been able to have done beforehand. And I think it's just having fresh eyes. And because it was quite a while ago, I can't really remember what I did, to be honest. (laughs) And also Mark is a wonderful director in the fact that he does sort of give you quite a lot of free reign, doesn't he, to Mm -hmm. do what you feel you want to do. 
and you know he tweaks things here and there and will suggest things but obviously if you naturally feel that that's the way that you think the character will go you don't i i personally don't think anyway that you want to go against that because then it's not going to look as natural mm. and it's not going to be as real because then i think that's when people get into acting mode rather mm-hmm. than actually being the character and you can see like they don't feel comfortable they they look awkward standing up it obviously doesn't feel right to them yeah. maybe we need to change their thought process so that then it works for them um you know whether it's standing up on a certain line or saying something in a certain way or moving on a certain action or movement and i think as long as you it sounds really typical doesn't it thing to say as long as you you know the reason why you're doing something and why your character would want to do it um you can sort of play around with it anyway can't you you know if i'm coming from a point of view of you know i'm angry on this line and i want to offend you but then mark says to me you know maybe come from a different way and actually i want to pity you for example you that's then going to change the way that you would say it so of course yeah Mark yeah. said to me that I was in danger of being a bit too clownish. So oh. that actually, because Vinny is a bit, he's a mummy's boy. He's under the thumb of his wife and his mother-in-law. Oh, right. Yes. And, uh, you know, he's, um, he does everything that everyone expects him to do. So Constrained by others. Yeah, indeed. But I was playing it a bit too clown-like. So I've changed that now because of what Mark said. And I'm more... I suppose settled but nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I think as well that you go into a show and a creative process and you have to be open. Of course. You because yeah. you know if if you go into something and you can't be directed and you can't do things in a different way give up yeah you, do you know what I mean? <laughs> so the arrogance of expecting others to move around you then isn't yes. it? Yeah and yes. also I think you know even if you really want something whatever but the director doesn't want it you just got to let it go yeah. and know that you know this is their vision and it might not be the same as yours and they might want you to come from a different point of view for that character and it's sort of take the note suck it up get on with it mm. do it and yeah you know as opposed to sort of trying to fight against it i think and that's why i anyway personally if i get material or script or anything you know before we get into the rehearsal room i'm not one of those people that will learn lines before i get there because then I'm going to have got myself into a place in a character and be like, oh, but that isn't how I say the line. Well, you need to change it, you know? So yeah. I try and do as little work as possible. Yes, I want to find out the character and an idea of how I think they would be in that scene and everything, but you, you've you just got to go through that process because otherwise, yeah, you don't end up being on the same page, I don't think. It's true. Mm. But that's the ground shift because there are these tweaks and these changes and you see how other characters, you know... you. You can't help but, when you've read a script, have some idea that this character will come towards your character in a particular way, and then that character, or the actor playing it, chooses not to do it in that way. Then you have to react in a different way to that. So there is that need to turn on a sixpence almost, Mm -hmm. isn't there? But you have to be nimble of foot, I think, and nimble of thought when you're an actor. Definitely. Yeah, and also as well, I I teach a lot, Mm. and the one thing that I always say to my kids is, you know, acting is reacting. That's all you're doing. But if you're not listening... And you know, observing how that character is, you're you're ne- you're not going to you know react naturally. And that's the thing is, yes, actors might say things in a similar way every night, but you know, if Harry with a spoon is you know a bit more angry in a scene, mm. and I don't react to it, then I'm not with them in that scene. You're not invested in it. Yeah. No, so right, you, yes. you and the public would spot that as well. Yeah. Exactly. Think, why you think why did she angry? react? Yes. Yeah. And yes. so. She's telephoning it in. <laughs> yeah, literally, yeah. It's a matinee. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think, it, you know, if you're not in it and you're not reacting to how that character is, and again, the same with you, you are then just saying lines and you're saying words and it, mm-hmm. it doesn't really mean anything. And, you know, you're not going to get that across to the audience. But I think as well with Harry, um, as in Matthew, who plays the role of Harry and I'm sure you're the same with Liz, when you start doing your lines together, like, me and Matt have had many discussions of, you know, do you think he thinks that? Because that's, that's where I'm coming from. And I sort of go, I don't know, let's just try it. Mm. You know, you, you try things out and you sort of go, oh, 
no, that, that really doesn't work or no, it doesn't feel right. And then you go, yeah, actually, I think, you know, and you make a decision. So as long as you know and decide what your character's thinking and feeling in that time, you can then really work off each other. Can I ask an added element to this then? Because, I mean, you were very complimentary to the writers and saying that, you know, the songs aren't punctuation, but they are just continuations of the scene, but with music. But of course, it's true. You only look at a set of lyrics on a page, they are words, and you've already got the dialogue, and so they can fuse into one. But music gives you an emotional underscore. Um, in some way, you know, it's, we're not necessarily talking Wagner, but the, you know, it, it sets something in stone in advance, and then you as actors have to work backwards from that. Or would you say that actually, if it's a well-written piece, it should be as much in simpatico with the way that you're looking to perform it from the text? Do I? I'm not sure if I'm making myself plain here. You no, are. I know, but, yeah. You what, are. Do you, what, do you, what do you think on that? I would say your latter answer. It's in simpatico with the text. It really. It, I don't know how to explain it really, but it is such a beautifully crafted show um, with all these fleshed out characters, even the smaller characters, which Mm. are played by all the different people in the cast. They're so beautifully real, you know. Properly drawn. Yes, it's, it's, it's just a beautiful show, really. Yeah, and I think also with the music, it does help you because you know the underscoring and things like Mm -hmm. that you know um whether we're just speaking in a scene um and like for example there's a song called him them it her and you know we're basically (laughs) all just a bit crazy yeah and and, you know we're all a bit panicked and "Ah, ah, yeah Yeah. and you know and and the music mirrors that so i just think it yeah like you say it's written so well that it just emphasises and it just helps you and it just it's just obvious, isn't it? You and know? all the lead characters have their own theme. Oh, light motif of a go-go. Yes, they do. And <laughs> Not a Vinnie, sentence I was expecting to use today. Vinny and Rita have a definite... You know that they're going to be there with this definite music cue. Yes, yeah. And the same with Harry and the same with yourself. Mm. It's... I think I've said it enough, but it is a beautifully written show and it's so much fun to do as well. Yeah, and they've... Not as in, you know, people don't think about what they write, obviously they do. But, yeah, everything just all works together, mm-hmm. doesn't it? And it's a world you can believe in. Yeah, well, definitely. and it, also people there's probably so much exist. underscoring, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. So much throughout the show, you know, that just helps enhance the feel and the mood of the piece. And, yeah, the music's fantastic. Well, using, as you said, these little thematic bits and pieces, I, mean, I use the term leitmotif uh, rather pretentiously, but... That's me. Not at all. Um, but um, actually, they, forgive me, sometimes a leitmotif can actually be a little bit, ta-da, our hero has arrived, or ta-da, the villain is here. No. But you're clearly telling me that's not the case here. No, it isn't. You know, yeah, the, no. the, the leitmotif actually is playing a much more subtle cueing role, but not as in a, it's not a, um, a fanfare cue. It is a subtle... Yeah, it's, it's not a subtle, like... Subliminal. Change, yeah. Yeah. It's a subtle change of mood. Mm. Um, in the music. Yeah, is... and when, you know, certain people come on, it's not like a ta-da, but there is, in some scenes anyway, a definite, that character's now in the room, you know. Oh, mm-hmm. God. And, <laughs> it, it, you know, if you're meant to be scared of that character, you know, the music helps and emphasises that. And, yeah, it's not sort of like a panto where you go, yes. ta-da! I am the prince! <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, every Swept time they, they enter on the stage, they get, you know, the same... Yeah. yeah. I, I like that idea that actually enhances the uh, situation in the room because actually if there was someone that you were trying to avoid, Rita, I think you said her character was, yes. and then um, you found yourself stumbling into a situation where Rita was already there, you would react in the way, oh, I don't want to be here. And if that cue can help the audience as well, it's, it's not yeah. just... It's it adds to the, the board, drama, doesn't it? Yeah. Doesn't it? it does. Of like, you know, certain things, it's like, dun, dun, dun. You're like, ah, yeah. Ah. like yeah. That really was a bit good. EastEnders, if I thought. <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun. It is a little bit... No, it's, not. it's better than EastEnders. Oh, well, that's oh. your. It's very, that's, it's very similar to East Enders. I mean, a lot happens. Yes, in one, it does. One in one show. episode. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to East Enders the musical, by the way. But, oh, uh, no. No, I'm not sure there ever will be. I was like, that's not happening. No, no. Right? Not yet. <laughs> Give it to you. We years. had Bird Edinburgh. Girl, Bad Girls. Well, that TV. Yeah. Oh, yes, indeed. Yes, I met but someone who saw that. But must uh, have been the only one. <laughs> <laughs> However, so. In a nutshell, then, if you were trying to sell this to somebody, you know, why should people come and see Lucky Stiff? Because I'm in it. Yeah, of and course. it's hilarious. And I'm really, and I'm really talented. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's 
It's true, though, not, she is. <laughs> I am. It's not your traditional musical. No. A lot of people will probably, if they've never seen it before anyway, will leave and say, I've never seen anything like that before. It is special and it's individual. It's entertaining. I don't think it's for a certain age group. I just think it's for everybody. I think it's hilarious. Yeah, it's universal. And, yeah, and it's not done very often. It's not no. going to be at the London Palladium. So... Come along. There's it's... no swearing. There's no. I was going to say violence, but there is a little bit of violence, but you don't actually see it. So, yeah. And there's it's, all... it's what they used to call on the back of the uh, on the back of Doctor Who DVDs. They would put minimal peril. Yes. <laughs> and there there's there's also the sex aspect of it as well. You did put that in big speech marks, by the way. Which yeah. Is very because enjoyable. you don't actually see that either. It's yeah. Just, yeah, no, that, it just yeah. It's not that kind it's of show. Just, yeah. yeah. It's a family it's just show. That you That's know a very happened. different kind of lucky stiff, I think. Yeah. Right? Yes, indeed. <laughs> I thank you. <laughs> With some really beautiful songs. It yeah, has got some really beautiful songs in it. It's... And funny ones too. Yeah. Now that's a secret, isn't it? Right, writing a song that's genuinely funny mm-hmm. is actually very, very difficult. Um, if you can make it work, it pays off tremendously. I think Kit Hesketh Harvey was yeah. saying um, he translates uh, opera into English quite often in new translations, uh, particularly the lighter ones like Mozart and people like that. And he said that it's very, very difficult to get the words which you're translating to get to a punchline anyway. But you've also then got to make that punchline hit the relevant mm-hmm. musical support for the punchline, yeah. which is like a double whammy. But he said if you get it right, it pays off more than any normal joke or yeah. laugh mm. What is it like for you as performers to sing a funny song? Because presumably you've also got to hit the marks absolutely, haven't you? Because well, you yeah, can and skid off beyond where you're supposed to be and miss the mark. The audience will tell you if they're finding well, it funny or not. Yes. So, you know, it's all down to the audience, really. And if they're invested in the show and they're enjoying it... I. I, your job is really easy. I mean, we don't go to work, do we? We just play. <laughs> yeah, we literally just mess around. I think that comedy works when it's real. Yeah. Because I think if you try to be funny, it's not funny. Yes, yeah, so you can't. You I, can mug a line, can't you? Yeah, and um, I played the role of Ado Annie um, a few years ago in Oklahoma, and. So many people can play that part and try to be funny and I'm going to say it like this because that will be funny. And, you know, characters are funny when you believe them Mm -hmm, because you think, I can't believe they've just said that. That's hilarious. But if you try and go like, da-da-da, bum, it doesn't work because then that's, you're trying too hard. And I think if you're playing it for real... Yeah. that's funny comedy yeah. dies under scrutiny anyway doesn't it I mean, mm. it's an organic sort of ethereal beast and it comes and it comes and if it's there it's lovely and if it isn't you've missed it so. yeah and you know people always talk about comedy timing and things like that and I think people can just try too hard mm-hmm. whereas if you play it for real yeah mm. you've, you've just got to be real and if your character is funny they're funny yeah and I think that's where some people maybe go wrong sometimes because they go into I need to be funny mode and you don't need to be because the character is written in that way you know the script that you've got or the songs or the words and everything if you believe what you're saying you know if you're trying to say that I don't know the grass is pink and you genuinely believe that yeah. people will think that's funny that you believe that but if you don't yeah. you're just saying a line trying to get a laugh and that's when I think it just doesn't work which is, reflects very closely to something you've both been saying earlier. You've both been talking about the reality of the character, and you were saying, and you put speech marks around it. You said, and it's that difference between acting in speech marks, mm. i.e., when you're presenting, and the organic truth, you know, the actual thing that's coming out of you as a person, which is real acting. Mm. Um, and it's the same with comedy, I think. You know, if, you're, if the character will, then the character will. Mm. Uh, but the character can't have it fo- foist upon them in a way that, you know, there's nothing intrinsically funny about the line necessarily. Right then. I've got two final questions for you. The first is the obvious one. How can people see this rather marvellous piece? <gasps> Come to the Drayton Arms. Which is, uh, the nearest tube is Gloucester Road. Yes. We open on Tuesday the 26th of uh, April. And we run until... And we run until the 14th of May. And we run from Tuesday to Saturday. Two shows on a Saturday. 
and yeah Monday and Sunday it's dark which is a shame because I really love doing this show yes and the show starts at 8 p.m. and 3 p.m. on Saturday matinees and it should be over by the Wednesday (laughs) I'm joking I'm joking tickets um, we have actually got some tickets uh, for certain performances where there's 10 tickets which are released for £10 oh, wow. a lot of those I think have already gone after that tickets are £12 or £16 pounds. it's very reasonable the, the lovely thing about the Drayton Arms is it's a lovely pub theatre upstairs, so it's got a nice venue. It's beautifully intimate. It's also a beautiful Victorian pub beneath, isn't mm-hmm. it? So there's drinks and food, exactly. It's marvellous. Yeah. That was the penultimate question. I have a final question for you both. Uh, you may have different answers. What is the thing you will take away from Lucky Stiff when that final curtain descends? Oh. For me, it'll be sadness, because mm. I've grown so close to these people. They're almost like my family now. You You're going to argue with them at Christmas? <laughs> Probably not. <Yeah>. No. <laughs> <laughs> we won't be around. No. I think that will be, be the one thing that I take away from it is probably sadness that it's over because mm. you always want these things to go on much longer. Yeah, that is the thing when you do a show is that it always, you know, and it's like anything in life, isn't it? You know, they say all good things come to an end. You become good companions. If and there's such, yeah. there's such nice There's such nice people, or every single one of them. Yeah. There's not one bad bone in anyone's body. And a different kind of lucky stiff again, I think. Yes. Indeed, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. And, I, and I'm obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I think especially when you do a fringe production, because there isn't many of us in the cast, there's ten of us, you know, and a couple of creatives and a few yeah. in the band. And I just think whenever you perform with people and you you trust them, yeah. And you instantly get that connection yeah. because it's you bonding, have to let it? yourself go and you have to try things and you have to just put yourself out there and see what happens, you know, in front of everybody in a rehearsal room where you have no idea what's going to come out and if it's going to work <laughs> or not, you know, and there's that trust element and it is always sad when a show comes to an end. I think that will convey to the audience as well that we mm. all get on. Mm. Yeah. You know, even though there are characters that are good and characters that are bad I think it will convey over to the audience that we're all having a marvellous yeah. time and that is infectious is it not? I think yeah. so I think you know you can't go and see a show and everyone be like absolutely loving their lives and having a really good time for you to not feel that you might not have a good time you might think you know it's terrible but you can't deny the fact that you know the people on stage are having a, a wonderful time I don't know what I'll take so please go onto the internet to Ticket Source and book your tickets to see Lucky Stiff at the Drayton Arms between yes. the 26th of April and the 14th of May. Really? Directed by Mark Kelly from MKEC, yes. which is... Yeah, Productions. Follow us on Twitter. Yes, Twitter. Um, at at London, London Lucky. Lucky. Um, and also, yeah, MKEC. We're also on Facebook. So you can come and like us on Facebook. Yes. But do, please, just come and see the show because you're going to have a great night, I promise. Yeah, don't take our word for it. Come and make up your own mind. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't like it, we're Catherine Jenkins and that yes. was the Albert Hall. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't tell you what a pleasure it's been. It's been marvellous. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Thos. Thank you for Thank you. Uh, telling me about, you know, the creative art. It's a privilege for me, who's not somebody like you, to hear what it is to be creative in this environment because it just astounds me every time and I'm looking forward very much to seeing you on stage. When are you coming? Yes. I'm definitely coming to see it. I'm probably going to be seeing it in the last week because uh, Excellent. because I want to read all those reviews that people have put on uh, Twitter and Facebook and say, oh, I know the actors, you know. Yes, <laughs> We absolutely. should be good by the third week. Yeah, we, should, yeah, we should know what we're doing <laughs> by them. We might get it right. <laughs> it is going to be fun, so please come and see it. Yeah. We really want your support. Yes. And we'll support you right back. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thos. Musical talk. How wonderful. That was Michelle Crook and Andrew Truluck talking about the wonderful Lucky Stiff a musical farce by Lynn Ayans and Stephen Flaherty. And if you want to go and see it, you can, and indeed you should. As they said in that interview, it's on at the Drayton Arms Pub Theatre. It's a rather wonderful intimate theatre upstairs above a beautiful Victorian pub. For further details, go to www.thedraytonarmstheatre.co.uk or call 020 7835 2301. And remember, it's on now until the 14th of May. So get your skates on. 
Well, we're nearly at the end of this episode, but very briefly as a kind of coda, I thought I'd very briefly touch upon that musical number called The Man Who Broke the Bank at Monte Carlo, which I mentioned right at the beginning of the programme. If you remember, I said that Lucky Stiff was based on a book called The Man Who Broke the Bank at Monte Carlo. And that is a phrase that is full of cultural resonances and has been for over a century because it's the name of a tremendously popular musical song that was first written in 1892 by a man called Fred Gilbert. Now, poor old Fred Gilbert didn't write very much else of any note and died in the very early years of the 20th century. But the man who made the song popular was a very intelligent musical singer by the name of Charles Coburn. And he was blessed with a tremendously long life and also the ability to speak many, many languages. He made that song popular in the later part of the Victorian era, but he was still singing it right up until the end of his life. And he was appearing in British musical films. The very last film he appeared in was in the Second World War when he was 91. That's older than the Queen is now, which I think is quite remarkable. And if you go on YouTube and type in Charles Coburn or the man who broke the bank at Monte Carlo, you can see some recordings that he made in his 80s singing that song in more than one language. And even recently, I was listening to an old edition of Round the Horn, a 1960s radio programme, when the central performer, Kenneth Horn, described how he went to France in disguise wearing a wig and uses the rather wonderful phrase, as I walked along the Bois de Boulogne with my independent hair, which is, as you can imagine, a comic reworking of one of the lines from the song The Man Who Broke the Bank at Monte Carlo. I only mention it because it's a song I know very well, and I suspect if you heard it, you'd know it too. How wonderful that a song from 1892 can still be resonant today as we talk about Lucky Stiff, currently on in London until the 14th of May. It's a very big world with lots of things in it, but it's very small when you connect them together. And on that seemingly profound but actually quite vacuous and empty statement, I'm nothing if not an idiot, let me say it's time for this episode to come to its glorious end. And the magic words for that are, as you know, goodbye. So here's me saying it. Goodbye. <laughs> To find out more about the world of musical talk and listen to past episodes, go along to our brand new website, musicaltalkpodcast.weebly.com or subscribe to us on iTunes and follow us on Facebook and on Twitter. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can at musicaltalkthos. This episode of Musical Talk edited and presented by Thos Ribbits. Copyright Musical Talk 2016. But I think Lucky Stiff is um, Lucky Stiff. Lucky Stiff <laughs> is up there among uh, with Ragtime. Da da da. Bum. Yeah.